The title of my talk today is uh, The Mystery of Light. It's very mysterious indeed, as you will see. Now, if you want to learn about light, what you really should do, you should come to MIT and take some courses. <laughs> the first time that you will encounter light is when you take in your freshman year course 802. A stands for physics. It's electricity and magnetism. And when you have taken that course, uh, you have some idea what light is. And then in your sophomore year, you take 803. That's the course, the physics of waves and vibrations. And then you have a much better idea. But then you take quantum mechanics, 804 and 805. And once you have taken quantum mechanics, you have no idea anymore what life is all about. <laughs> and frankly, if you ask me, do you know what light is, my answer is no. No, not really. However, I can use and manipulate all those complicated equations that I've seen in all those courses. And they allow me to make certain predictions of what light will do under certain circumstances. Does that mean that I have an understanding of it? No, but I know how to turn the crank. It is a recipe, and I know how to use that recipe. Now, I will try to convince you today that light comes in the form of waves. However, that's not the whole story. Uh, I could uh, convince you tomorrow, give another lecture tomorrow, that light is not waves, but that light comes in the form of particles. And that is one of the great mysteries of light, and at the end of my talk I'll say a few more words about that. But my goal today is to convince you that light comes in the form of waves. In the 17th century, it was the great physicist and mathematician Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, who suggested that life comes in the form of particles. But my countryman, the Dutchman Huygens, he said that they, they came in the form of waves. And that was a key issue in the 17th century. You're probably all familiar with waves. Uh, water waves, for instance, is probably the most familiar. If you tap on the water with a certain frequency, you get beautiful waves that propagate over the surface of the water. You can throw a pebble in a pond and you also see water waves. So waves move with a certain speed. And so we call them, therefore, traveling waves. And the speed uh, varies a great deal in the case of water. Uh, the speed can be as low as one mile per hour, can be as high as several hundred miles per hour, depends on various things. The tsunami waves can go as fast as 500 miles per hour. Now, sound is also a wave. Uh, I produce sound by oscillating my vocal cords, and what they do, they produce in the air high pressure and low pressure areas. They push and pull on the air. When something moves in this direction, compresses the air, comes in this direction, pulls on the air. So you get high pressure and low pressure areas, and they propagate out to you with uh, the speed of sound, uh, which is something like uh, uh, 760 or so miles per hour. Light is also a traveling wave. Light moves very fast. 300,000 kilometers per second, 200,000 miles per second, roughly. The sun is 150 million kilometers away from us, so it takes the light from the sun eight, min eight minutes to reach us. To put that in perspective, if a jet plane could fly to the sun with constant speed, then it would take 20 years to reach the sun. We have a name for these uh, light waves. It's a very difficult name. I suggest you first hold on to your chair before I tell you the name. Uh, we call them electromagnetic waves. Not only light, but there are other forms of electromagnetic waves, like radio waves and X-rays, infrared, UV, all members of the family of electromagnetic waves. So clearly, it has to do with electricity, and it has to do with magnetism. Now, you all are familiar with electricity, and you probably know about magnetism. You have magnets on your refrigerators at home, no doubt. I happen to wear a magnetic brooch today. You see, this is a magnet, and it sticks very nicely. And all of that has to do with light one way or another. Electricity and magnetism is what light is all about. 
Some of the electromagnetic waves, or most of them actually, are invisible. Light is what we can see with our eyes, but infrared you cannot see, ultraviolet light you cannot see, some animals can, but we cannot. However, you can feel infrared light. It's the body heat that is infrared, you can feel that. So we have sensors that we can at least detect the uh, electromagnetic waves in the infrared. I have decided to put a minimum of equations on the blackboard, but there is one that is very important, because you're going to see it throughout this lecture, and so if you're ready for this, let us take a look at a wave. Uh, here is a wave, and this could be a water wave, or it could be a wave that you put in a string, in a violin string. And this wave is propagating in this direction, and the speed of that propagation, let's call that V. The separation from mountain top to mountain top is called the wavelength, for which we in physics give the symbol lambda. Now, in order to generate this wave, I'm going to tap on the water up and down, and I can do that with a certain frequency. So I'm going to introduce the word frequency for you for which we will write the symbol F, and that simply means how many times per second I move it up and down. It could be a string or it could be the tapper on water. So it is the number of oscillations, number of oscillations per second. And we abbreviate that, the unit that we give that is really oscillations per second, but we normally write for that hertz capital H, small z. And so, ten hertz means that I make ten oscillations per second. Hundred hertz means hundred oscillations per second. Now, there is another quantity, T, which is the period of one oscillation. How long does one oscillation last? It's immediately obvious that if you have a frequency of ten oscillations per second, that one oscillation only lasts one-tenth of a second. And so therefore T, which is the period of the oscillation, of one oscillation, T is clearly one divided by F. So if F is ten hertz, just as an example, ten oscillations per second, then T is one-tenth of a second. This should not be too tough for you to handle. Very good. Now, if I move my hand up and down here, if this were a string, in capital T seconds, and if the disturbance move with a velocity V, then the distance over which that disturbance has moved, that distance is of course V times T. And so therefore there is a key relationship between the wavelength lambda, the velocity of the wave, and the period of the wave. So in this amount of time, the disturbance has moved this far, which is our definition of wavelength, and since capital T is also one over F, I can also write that as V divided by F. And this one I want you to hold on to, because that will come back during my lecture again and again and again. In the case of water, the disturbance of the water is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. You see here the mountains, and you see the valleys. They are in this direction, the water goes up and down, yet the wave propagates in this direction. And that we give that a name, we call that transverse waves. Transverse indicates that the direction of motion of the water is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So they are traveling transverse waves. In the case of sound, the situation is different because when my vocal cords vibrate, they push the air in, high pressure, and then they suck on the air, low pressure. And so there, the disturbance of the air, the high pressure and the low pressure regions, are in the same direction of motion. That's why it's very difficult to make a drawing of a sound wave. And we give them a different name. We call them, therefore, longitudinal wave. And longitudinal means that the displacement of the air is in the same direction as the uh, direction in which it moves.
light, it's also a traveling wave, and is also a transverse wave. There are electric and magnetic fields that oscillate, and they are perpendicular to the direction in which the light moves. Now the light can move through empty space. Light can move through vacuum. You can see the moon, you can see the sun, and you can see the stars. And in between, most of it is vacuum. Now in the case of water waves, we need water to make the wave. And in the case of sound, we need air to make the wave. Not only to make the wave, but the wave can only propagate. As long as there is air, I can propagate sound to you. Sound can never propagate through vacuum. You need the air to support the wave. When you look at this wave, for instance, if this were a water wave, the water that goes up and down here never ends up here. So the water itself does not move in the direction of propagation, but simply bobs up and down. And the same is true with sound. The air that I have in my mouth, lucky you, does not end up in your ears. But it is the pressure wave that reaches you. And when that reaches you, your eardrum starts to shake and then your brains are constructed in such a way that you say, I hear sound. In that sense, you can perhaps uh, compare the sound waves with a queue of people, a whole row of people are waiting at the supermarket, and at one end, one person goes boom, and then the next person goes boom, and the next person goes boom, and finally, at the end of the row, the last person goes boom. And you see, that person who was standing there did not move along the direction of the wave. But it was the disturbance that moved along the direction of the wave. So clearly sound cannot exist in vacuum. So when you see these gorgeous scientific, uh, these movies, science fiction, and you hear in outer space a huge bang, well, that's, that's a problem. Because sound cannot exist in vacuum and cannot travel through vacuum. Light is very different. There is a big difference between electromagnetic waves, light, and in this case, the water and the sound waves. Because in the case of light, since it can go through vacuum, there is actually something that wasn't there before that now is in vacuum. And that is that mysterious electromagnetic field. So vacuum is completely empty space. We do not need any medium there to support the wave, which we did with water and which we did with sound not with electromagnetic waves. So even though water does never move from this position to this position, in the case of light, there is actually something, electromagnetic fields, that do move and that make it very special. So there is a big difference in that sense, which many people, many of you often do not, do not appreciate. Now comes the question, of course, what is oscillating in the case of electromagnetic waves. Well, what is oscillating somewhere, without you knowing it often, something must be oscillating, and what is oscillating are electric charges. And these electric charges produce spherical waves in all directions, just like sound. When I speak to you, waves move out in all directions. Electromagnetic waves move out also in a spherical way, and they carry with them then this uh, electromagnetic field, which is produced by oscillating charges. Let's try to be a little bit more quantitative and use this equation. We're going to use it for water, we're going to use it for sound, and we are going to use it for light, because those are the three substances today which are at the center of my talk. I have over there a very uh, thin a, a pan of water with, with very shallow amount of water. There's only four millimeters of water in that, in that pan. And since physics is my, not only my hobby, but is my life, I can calculate the speed of water waves when there is only four millimeters of water. I'm not going to tell you how I do that, but the speed of water waves when you have four millimeters of water, that speed is roughly 20 centimeters per second, 0.2 meters per second. You have to take my word for it. If I change the depth of that water, the speed will change. 
if I tapped on the water with a frequency f, if I did that with 10 hertz, then you can calculate now what the wavelength will be. Lambda then is um, V divided by F, so that is 0.2 divided by 10, and so that is 0.02 meters, for which we would all say that is two centimeters. It's about this much. And if I tapped with twice the frequency, so the frequency doubles, then the wavelength is twice as small, it's only one centimeter, and if I tap at five hertz, the wavelength would be four centimeters. And this is something that I would like to show you, maybe nothing new. I want to remind you, without meaning to insult you, that whenever we have a line, we call that in mass one dimension, a violin string, if the wave moves along a violin string, that would be a one-dimensional wave. If we have a surface, such as water, then the waves that travel over water are two-dimensional waves. They do not just go along a line, but they go out in all directions. And then when we deal with spherical waves, which is sound and electromagnetic radiation, we call that 3D. And I will often refer to this shorthand notation just saying 1D, 2D, and 3D. So just to warm you up to the idea, uh, let's take a look at some water waves, which then propagate roughly with that speed that I have there, 0.2 meters per second. Uh, it may surprise you, but it's a fact that in the case of this shallow water, the four millimeters, that if I change the frequency, then the speed of the water wave will not change. So that's important in this case that we keep the speed constant and you will see then that there is a change in the, in the wavelength. So we're going to show that to you there. We are tapping on there with a, a tapper. I want to make it dark. And I have to turn on the, the TV. And there you go. Well, this is nothing too exciting, but uh, you are looking here at a two-dimensional wave, circles that come out from the tapper. Uh, we are disturbing the water. The water itself is not moving with the wave, but it's a disturbance that moves with the wave. And they move very fast, 20 centimeters per second, so there's no way almost that you can follow that, but you can see the dark and the brighter areas, which is of course a lens effect, and one of them represents no doubt the mountains, and the other represents the, the valleys. And that separation from dark to dark is roughly indeed two centimeters. When I look at it here, I can see it better because I don't have any magnification. It's about two centimeters, so we are very close to 10 hertz. If I go to a much lower frequency, this is much lower than I did before. Then you see indeed that the wavelength increases, still traveling, but it increases. And that was my goal that I at least shown you a traveling wave, two dimensional traveling wave. I don't know. That was not my intention to lower that. All right. So traveling wave of water. How about sound? So this was water. Sound. The speed of sound in this room is um, about 340 meters per second. That's non-negotiable. Um, it will change a little bit with temperature. So V is 340 meters per second. Suppose I have um, an oscillating tuning fork. I have one here. 
and I oscillate the tuning fork with a frequency 256 hertz. So you all experts now, I could ask you what is the wavelength. I cannot make you see the wavelength, but I can make you hear the sound. And the wavelength then, lambda, is V divided by F. So lambda, longitudinal wave, it's 340 divided by 256, which is about 1.3 meters. And so what that means then, that if you look at the areas, the locations in, in the air where the pressure is the highest, which can be compared then with the mountains of the water, they are 1.3 meters apart. And the location where the pressure is the lowest, they're also 1.3 meters apart. So you see, it's much easier to draw a water wave than it is to draw a longitudinal wave. So I can make you listen to this. That's just the way it is. But you have no idea, of course, that, it is, that the wavelength is 1.3 meters. So this is a tuning fork that oscillates 256 times per second. If I increase the frequency, I go to 4,000 hertz. Then, of course, the wavelength goes down substantially. You can check that on your own now. The wavelength becomes only eight and a half centimeters, if I didn't make a mistake in my calculation. And that's a much higher frequency, so your eardrums go faster back and forth, and then the wavelength has enormously decreased. 4,000 compared to 256. So that's sound. So now, sound, by the way, is three-dimensional wave, right? It's a spherical wave that moves out in all directions. It goes in this direction, this direction, this direction, as opposed to the water wave, which is a two-dimensional wave. So let's now turn to electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation has a speed through vacuum of 300,000 kilometers per second. It's about the same through air. Little less, but insignificant. The difference is insignificant. And so we will just write down that the speed is 300,000 kilometers per second, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. I just assume that you are familiar with the notation 10 to the power 8. It's a 1 with 8 zeros. All right, and if you go from kilometers per second to meters per second, you have another factor of 1,000, and so you get 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Well, let's take uh, FM radio waves, frequency 100 hertz, 100 megahertz, 100 megahertz. This mega, by the way, stands for 10 to the 6. Uh, we just write that as a capital M, so let me be cleaner and write it down as 100 times a million so that it's 10 to the 8 hertz. So the wavelength, lambda, is V divided by F, is 3 meters. So the wavelength of your typical FM radio station is 3 meters. Radar, which would be 10 gigahertz, 10 billion oscillations per second, would give you a wavelength of only 3 centimeters. Peter is quite familiar with uh, radar. <laughs> How about light? If we have light, I will tell you a secret. And the secret is that I happen to know the wavelengths of light. Remember, I was going to convince you that light is going to be waves. Now, anything that is a wave has a wavelength. And so if I tell you this secret that light not all colors have the same wavelengths, but roughly the wavelength of light is about half a micron, and a micron is one millionth of a meter. So the wavelength of light is then roughly five times ten to the minus seven meters. It's half a micron. Many people like to express the wavelength of light in terms of nanometers, which is 10 to the minus 9 meters, then it would be 500 nanometers. You see both in books. Some people like it to express it in terms of angstroms, and it is 5,000 angstroms. Whatever you prefer, be my guest. But in meters, and since I work with meters here, it is 5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. 
So I told you this. So now we can calculate the frequency. Because the frequency now follows from our famous equation. The frequency now equals the velocity divided by lambda. And so the frequency equals the, the velocity divided by lambda. So that is three times ten to the eight divided by five times ten to the minus seven. And that is about six times ten to the fourteen hertz. Six times ten to the fourteen oscillations per second. So there are charges, without you knowing it and without my realizing it, which oscillate back and forth a six with fourteen zero times per second. And that's a very representative number for light. In the case of blue light, it's a little higher. In the case of red light, it is a little lower. So now, how can I demonstrate this? Now, I demonstrated water for you. We were tapping ten times per second, and then we went up to an unimaginably high number of 256 times per second, even 4,000 times per second. How on earth can I go up now to ten to the 14 times per second? Well, I don't have to do anything. Just look around you. All the light that you see is generated by charges that are oscillating. So this is the easy, easiest demonstration for me as I can think of. So there are charges that are oscillating with these frequencies, and they produce the light. Now, whether light consists of um, particles, as suggested by Newton, or whether they consist of waves, as suggested by my countryman Huygens, which actually should be pronounced Huygens. Uh, none of you can say Huygens. And if any one of you can say Huygens, there is a 99.9% .9 chance that you're Dutch. Even Peter, <laughs> Peter, you cannot say Huygens. Try it. Oh, oh Peter. <laughs> you're a friend of mine, so I won't say much more then. <laughs> Huygens. But in the, in the lecture hall in the United States, you call the poor man Huygens. So Huygens suggested that they are waves, and Newton suggested that they are particles. And that was a very controversial issue in the 17th and in the 18th century. And it was not until 1801 that this was settled once and for all. At least that was the belief in 1801. So let's now turn to the proof that light are, comes in the form of waves. Let's first return to water again. So instead of having one tapper on the water, on the ripple tank there, you can imagine that I have two tappers. So I have one tapper here, and I have one tapper here, and they are a distance d apart. And so here is the line in the middle of them. So this one is tapping and this one is tapping. They are synchronized, they are connected together, so they always f f tap with the same frequency. And so this one will start to produce circular waves, just as you have seen. And this one will do the same. So this is then the wavelength. This represents this is my shorthand notation for mountains, and that propagates out over the surface. Now imagine now that I pick a particular point, this point P, and that point P has a certain distance to this tapper, and it has another distance to that tapper. In physics, we call this the path length, but it's really the distance. The path length is different for those two. In other words, one wave from one tapper reaches this point earlier than the other wave. This one gets here earlier than that one. Now, if the difference in these path lengths is the difference, the difference in path lengths, if that difference is one half of a wavelength, it's clear 
that when the mountain arrives from this wave, that the valley arrives from that wave. Because there is going to be a difference in travel time. It would take this wave one half T seconds longer to reach that point than it takes this wave, because half a wavelength takes this amount of time. And so the two waves, as we would say in physics, are 180 degrees out of phase when one wants to drive the water up, the other wants to drive the water down. And the net result is that the water will not move. And this is very characteristic for a wave. The water will stand still. And we have a name for that. We call this destructive interference. The two waves annihilate each other in that point P, and the water will not move. So, for instance, if the wavelength uh, was two centimeters, as it was during our ripple tank experiment, then it would simply mean that if this pass is one centimeter longer than that pass, we would have met that condition. Then the difference in length, in pass length, is half a wavelength is one centimeter. If I show you in time what this point P will be doing, so I'm plotting here now time, so be very careful. What I was plotting here was not time. I was plotting here actually the water itself. So this was space, now this is time. And I want to know at what time that point P is where. The point P, all the point P is doing is this, up, down, up, down, up, down on the water level. Well, so what you're going to see is something like this. And the separation in time between this and this is then capital T. So at this moment in time, point P was up here, and at this moment in time, it's up again at that point. And so this is then a nice way of saying what the position of P is as a function of time. Now you get destructive interference when the wave from the other one, if the other one were only present, then you would see this. And of course point P has to go with both of them. One wants to do this and the other wants to do this, so point P is going to oscillate with the sum of the two, what we call displacements, the maximum displacement we call amplitude, and therefore point P will not move at all. If you add up these two curves, you end up with this. So point P will stay put. Destructive interference. Now, there are many points for which the difference in path is one half wavelength. It is immediately obvious that there should also be a point, for instance, somewhere here on this line. There is somewhere a point here, I just stab at it, say this point, for which this distance minus that distance is half a wavelength. So that point also experiences destructive interference. And so you can construct now on this surface all the points for which the difference in path length to this stepper and this stepper is one half wavelength. Do any one of you know what kind of curve you get? What do we call that curve in math? Don't feel bad if you don't know. I will draw the curve roughly, yeah? It's not a sine wave. You and I talked about it already when you came in. What do you think it is? I have to pick it a little up. Here, I have here a microphone. So my question is what do you think this curve looks like? Uh, my guess would be a paraboloid, but you said it was hyperboloid. Yeah, it is a hyperboloid, yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it's a nice try. So you're going to get a hyperbola, and it goes like this.
And if you have one here, then clearly you should also have one here for the same reason. About the same distance, so you get also a hyperbola here. Because clearly, if this wave from here comes later in time, then the wave from this point comes here later in time. So again, you have a difference between the two of one half wavelength, so 180 degrees out of phase. So there's one hyperbola here and there's one hyperbola here for which the difference in path is one half lambda and this one is also one half lambda. But you can construct other hyperbole for which the difference in path is not one half lambda but is one and a half lambda or two and a half lambda. And in all cases, will you have destructive interference? And if you don't believe that, you should do your own homework and convince yourself that indeed, this case, the waves are 180 degrees out of phase, mountain arrives when the other one has a valley, but if the separation is, uh, the difference in pass is one and a half lambda, you have exactly that same situation. Always destructive interference. But now imagine that the difference in path length is zero. And there are lots of points for which the difference in path length is zero. For instance, here, everywhere on this line, the distance to this tapper and to this tapper, exactly the same. So the difference in path length here is zero. This is a terrible abbreviation, distance in path length, dp, is zero. What does that mean? Will you now have destructive interference there, or is there something else special when the difference is zero? Something else. Let me uh, get you the microphone, because that's always nice to hear your reactions. Yes, but you'd have something else, and, and um, if, if it's zero, you'd have the same mountain or the same valley. So, so what does that mean then, that the two waves would, would sum, would add. They would add, exactly. They would add the maximum possible, and that's what we call, we have a name for that, constructive interference. One is destructive, they kill each other. In the other case, they support each other. So now we're going to get constructive interference. So this was destructive, and we have then constructive interference when the difference is either zero or lambda or two lambda or three lambda. If you don't believe this, do your homework and you will see that the waves are then again in phase. We say the waves arrive in phase. And if the difference is neither one half nor one, well, then it is something in between. Then you don't get zero and you don't get the maximum possible, but you get something in between. If you want to have a rough idea about how many of those hyperbola you have with destructive interference, we call those, by the way, in the case of water, we call them nodal lines, just a jargon, and we call these anti-nodal lines. So where you have constructive interference, we use the words anti-nodal, where you have destructive, we use the word nodal. If you want to know roughly how many nodal lines there are and how many anti-nodals there are, anti-nodal uh, lines there are, just roughly, it's always 2D divided by lambda. And if you have some time and you spend 10 minutes on the problem, you will see why that is. So always hold on to the idea that you would see the total number is 2D over lambda. D over lambda on one side and D over lambda on the other side. If you add them up, you get 2D divided by lambda. So to get a rough idea, we're going to use that number, and that's why I give you that number. I can show you on an overhead then the idea of constructive and destructive interference is, if it isn't clear yet, uh, because I'm going to show you now again that same curve as a function of time, what P is doing, and then I have the option now of moving the two waves relative to each other. So the destructive interference then is for all points on the surface of the water which experience this, that one wave says you have to go down and the other wave says, sorry, I want you to go up. 
And then the constructive interference is this situation, whereby the two waves add up, you get the maximum possible amplitude, you get twice the amplitude that you would get if you only had one tamper. And then there is, of course, everything in between when the condition is neither destructive nor constructive. Let me check my timer. Oh, boy. You're doing very well, Irene. You'll be proud of me. So now I will show this to you. I'm going to try to make an effort to demonstrate this to you. And it is harder than you think. And that's why we have an expert, Marcos, who invaluable in helping me out. Oh, you already set it up. So now we have two tappers. And we're going to tell you that D, the distance between the two tappers, is about four centimeters. Sorry that I changed from meters to centimeters, but that makes sense now. If I tapped with 10 hertz, if, then lambda would be two centimeters, right? Remember, 10 hertz would give lambda equals two centimeters. So then 2d divided by lambda is about four. Eight divided by two is four. So you can expect then roughly four nodal lines. If the frequency, however, is higher, then you expect, what do you expect, more nodes or fewer nodes? Frequency is higher, wavelength is lower, shorter, shorter wavelengths, more nodal lines. So for higher frequencies, you get more nodal lines than you get for low frequencies. And I will try to show you at least two or three different frequencies. You will see the nodal lines move. That's obvious, of course, because if you meet the condition that here exactly the two cancel each other, that means that the difference in path length is one half lambda. The moment that I change the wavelength, that point is no longer on a nodal line. So the nodal lines will shift, and if you increase the frequency enough, you will see that new nodal lines move in. So you get more of these hyperboloidal surfaces, uh, not surfaces, lines. But in any case, we will only deal with a few of them. And the reason why we deal with a few is because the wavelength is of the same order as the separation between the tappers. So, it is not as easy as you think, and we may have to do some adjustment. And therefore, you need a little bit of patience, but we will, we will do the best we can on this. I'll make it completely dark. You ready, Marcos? Yeah. And I have to turn on the... Okay. Well, this is already not bad. Don't do anything now, Marcos. Let me just uh, go into the lecture hall. So there are two tappers now. You have to take my word for that. But when you look at the uh, picture, uh, it is immediately obvious, at least to me, that I see here a lane where the water doesn't move. These are traveling waves, and the water stands still here. It also stands still here. It also stands still there. Can you increase the frequency a little, uh, Marcos? Increase it a little more. Hold it, yeah. So you already see that this lane was moving. It's very clear now. You see no ripples here. See no ripples here. This is beautiful. And here is, I think, one. Can we increase the frequency a little more? Let's see whether we can get uh, four nodal lines. A little more. Hold it. Yeah. You see one here. One here, they get closer together. You see one here. No, I don't see this one coming in yet. You can try a little bit faster maybe, Marcos. A little bit of a med Yeah, there it is. You see it here? Ah, oh, beautiful. One, two, three, four. So what this means now, that right here on this whole pass, right in the middle, that the difference in distance to the tappers is one half wavelength, and here it is one and a half wavelength. Here it is also one half wavelength, and here it is one and a half wavelengths. The difference here in pass is zero, so those are your antinodal, and here the difference is lambda, and here the difference is two lambda, and here the difference is lambda, and there the difference is two lambda. So you've seen all the ingredients that are characteristic for wave phenomena, which is interference pattern. That the two motions can annihilate each other, can kill each other, the two waves, or they can 
support each other to the maximum possible, which we call constructive interference. Marcos, this was superb. Thank you. I think this is uh, an ideal moment to uh, have a break and to make you think about this. After the intermission, I will then uh, continue this whole way of thinking of interference with sound, and I will bring your intuition to a test, and then we will continue it even to the extreme absurdity trying to get interference with light, uh, which, in which case we bring you even beyond <laughs> what this <laughs> imagination can handle. Okay, Irene, five minutes, do what you want. That was a luxurious break, six and a half minutes. All right, so now comes a key question. If somehow two water waves can annihilate each other, and given the fact that sound is also a traveling wave, is it possible that somehow sound plus sound gives silence. In other words, is it possible that if I have a loudspeaker here, and I have a loudspeaker here, 2,000 hertz, nice tone, all of us can hear it, are there then locations in this lecture hall where there is no sound at all, and if that is true, there will be others where there is a lot of sound. Because if there are locations where you have destructive interference, there should be others where you have constructive interference. What do you think? Give it a shot. In the worst case, you're wrong. I'm, I'm wrong so often. You shouldn't feel embarrassed about that. So the question is, can sound plus sound make silence? Total silence. Total silence. Who wants to give that a shot? Who is brave enough? Are you afraid? Do you have an opinion? Now, you always have an opinion. I will get back to you. You have an opinion. Yeah, I haven't heard much of you. What do you think? Well, it it's sounds a wave. That means it can, be, it, can, it can be constructive interference and destructive interference. So your answer is absolutely yes. Yes. There should be locations in this room whereby there is no sound. Who agrees with that? No. Who does not agree with that? Okay, can you give me your reasons why that doesn't, not the case? I, I think it's the case empirically, but you have two ears. And depending on the wavelength, will both ears hear that null sound? Well, all right, but you do say then that yes, there are locations where there is no sound. Whether you can find those locations is then a different issue. Yeah. Very good. Any other suggestions? Here is someone who has another opinion. Go ahead. There's a problem of noise. You're not in an isolated environment. Those, th there might be no sound contributed from them, but you have the sound from the speaker. From All right. I hear you, and you, of course, are right, but what I meant is that the 2,000 hertz would go away. And the fact that, the fact that you're opening your sandwich bag, which is very annoying, that sound, <laughs> that sound I will accept, okay? So that's fine. Well, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So let us turn on the sound, and I advise you to start walking through the lecture hall and see whether you can find locations where you hear no 2,000 hertz. Not just a little, but no. Be my guest.
All right, why don't you return to your seats? And I would like you to share with me your findings. So let me first ask you the di most difficult question. Were you able to find locations where you absolutely did not hear the 2,000 words? Did any one of you find such a location? Okay. Did you notice that when you walked around that there were certain areas where the sound was substantially stronger than others? Yes. Okay. Now let's be a little bit more quantitative to understand what you have done and what you should not have done. More important. The separation of the two loudspeakers is about two meters. You could have seen that. And I also told you that the frequency was 2,000 hertz. That's key information which you did not use. And I don't blame you for that. In fact, I set you up that way. So the frequency F is 2,000 hertz. So lambda equals 340 meters per second divided by 2,000. And that translates to 0.17 meters, so that is 17 centimeters. Yeah? We agree? 17 centimeters. How many of those nodal surfaces would there be? You're no longer talking about nodal lines now. It's no longer a hyperbole because the wave is three-dimensional spherical waves, so now the whole thing expands to surfaces. There are going to be paraboloidal surfaces here for which then the intensity should be near zero. And so the number of those nodal surfaces would be 2 d divided by lambda, and the distance, as you all could have seen, is about 2 meters, so that is 4 divided by 0 0.17, 0 0.17, and that, I think, is something like about 24 or so, 24. So there are 24 of those surfaces that come out here, and there the intensity should be close to zero, provided you're not too close to the loudspeakers, because if you're too close to the loudspeakers, then of course the amplitude of this sound is stronger than from that one, and then they can never add up to zero. That's another issue. You have to be a little bit away from it. Without going through the math of exactly where those uh, surfaces are, I can give you an answer which you probably could very roughly have estimated anyhow, and that is, first of all, that the separation in space where those surfaces are depends of where you are. The farther you are away, the farther they are apart, as you saw on the water tank experiment. If you're farther away from the tappers, those nodal lines were farther apart. The same is true here, of course. So they just fan out like this, and very far in the audience there, they are farther apart than here. If you are at a distance of about five meters from here, which, say, Peter is, most of you are, then you can calculate roughly that the separation between total silence and maximum sound, between minima and maxima, between destructive interference and constructive interference, is roughly 20 centimeters. So therefore, you could have stayed in your seats and simply moved your heads and see whether you can find when you move them over a distance of about 20 centimeters. So let's do this experiment again. Who found points of absolute silence? All right. So now I'll tell you what you did and what you should not have done. 
For one thing, people move their heads way too fast. Your ears are amazingly sensitive, so the locations of real absolute silence are not this wide. They may only be something like a few millimeters, because if you move slightly away from constructive, destructive interference, your ear already begins to hear sound. That's number one. But coming back to this gentleman's comment, if the separation between the nodal surfaces and the anti-nodal surfaces is 20 centimeters, what is about the distance between this ear and that ear? That is about 20 centimeters. Did I do that purposely? The answer is yes. So you will never find the position in the lecture hall whereby you hear no sound. You got to close one ear, and some of you did that. Close one ear completely, move extremely slowly, and when the intensity of the, of the sound goes down, move even slower. And I can assure you that you will be able to find points whereby sound is as close to zero as you can imagine. I was there this morning and I tried it. So I'll give you your last chance. Close one ear and move very slowly. So the separation here is a little shorter than it is there where Peter is. Peter is about 20 centimeters. Wow, you look scary. No one is moving anymore who now found locations where, all practical purpose, you can say, yes, it was silent. No one? You didn't. You couldn't find any. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I could. <laughs> Did you find huge differences in, in sound intensity? You did, but you could never get it way down to zero. Well, one of the reasons could well be we get reflections of sound from the wall. Of course, that's, that's a nuisance. There's also another reason that if you sit right here, then the sound that comes from this one has a higher amplitude than it one comes from this one, because you are closer, and that, of course, you also cannot add up to exactly zero, but you can come close to that. So now comes the last burning question, and that is, if sound plus sound can give silence, and I hope I have convinced you that it really can, though you may not have heard it absolutely silent, is it possible that light plus light can give darkness. So we have water, waves can annihilate each other, sound plus sound can give silence. Can light plus light give darkness? And if that is the case, then light plus light should also be able to give a lot of light. Destructive interference means there would be locations in the classroom where two light sources would give no light, and other locations where constructive interference where you have light. Anyone's guess? Come on, in the worst case, you're wrong. So can light plus light give, si give silence? That means darkness. If we can demonstrate that, I think we've made the point that we deal with waves. Yes? Um, operating purely on the assumption that light is a wave that behaves like that, we'd be inclined to say yes. But off the top of my head, I don't recall any observational evidence of that, and no fancy science demo, so I'd be inclined to say no. So he is inclined to say no. Do any one of you support the no? Yeah, you support the no, or you... No, no, I say yes. I mean, if light is a wave, it can experience destructive and constructive interference again. So you, be, you are a believer. You really begin to believe physics. I've made a con I've converted him. So who is in support of the idea that light and light should be able to give darkness? Oh boy. And who says no, probably not? You alone. <laughs> but Jung was also alone when he demonstrated that light plus light can give darkness. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you too. So I gave it away, I said that Young in 1801 demonstrated indeed that light plus light gives darkness, can give darkness. 
And it's very difficult to do the experiment because you cannot do it with two light bulbs. Remember I said the tappers are synchronized. That was easy. It's also easy to synchronize the loudspeakers because they are connected to the same electronics. But how do you synchronize two light bulbs? And that you cannot do. And so the breakthrough that Young made, that he realized that if light is a wave, and if you make the wave go through two openings, so this is one opening, and this is another opening, and this separation is D. So this could be pinholes, but it could also be slits perpendicular to the blackboard, so slits like this. And if you have a light source very far away, and if light is really a wave, then spherical waves would move out, and so by the time they reach here, they come like this, and what you would see is that each one of these openings will then generate waves. You could do a similar experiment with water. We could have shown you the interference pattern with water with one tapper and then with a wall with two openings. But the two tappers gave us a little bit better result. So Jung realized that if you have a light source far away and you have two openings here, that on this side you should have all the conditions then for a destructive and for constructive interference. We do this experiment with a laser, which Jung did not have, and that's very nice because lasers, of course, are very powerful. Um, the separation that I will use today is one quarter of a millimeter, and the wavelength of the laser that we will use, the red laser, the wavelength is uh, 633 nanometers, 633 meters, 10, 10 to the minus 9 meters. So if I now ask you how many surfaces are there whereby there is total destructive interference, that would be 2D divided by lambda. It's a high number. And so you can imagine that those surfaces, those destructive hyperboloids and the constructive hyperboloid are close together. We have it set up here, and here we have these two very narrow grooves, quarter millimeter apart, and here we have the red laser, and we're going to see there on the screen the results of the light intensity, and that will show you beyond any doubts that you will see locations where it is completely dark and other locations where the light is very strong, and that's where there is the constructive interference. I need my laser because I have to be able to point it out to you. There it is. So you see here areas whereby it's absolutely no light. You see these separations on the screen are no more than uh, maybe two centimeters there. So you can imagine how close the dark, the destructive interference locations and the constructive interference locations are. But here you see in front of your eyes what Jung first did in 1801, which of course equipment that was nowhere nearly as good as what we have here. And this then was in those days convincing evidence that um, we're dealing with uh, with waves, and if you know the distance from, from here to the wall, which I normally call capital L, and if you know the separation of the two slits, and if you can measure the separation there between darkness and bright and darkness, then you can calculate the wavelength. That's pure math, that is not physics, but that is just pure math. It comes down to hyperbolas and intersect them with a screen, so that is really not all that difficult. So now comes the question, why was this absolutely conclusive evidence that we are dealing now with waves instead of with uh, particles? And this is very fundamental. If light is waves, then you see here on a screen this interference pattern which goes way beyond the separation D. 
goes way beyond, all the way there, all the way to here. Do you see bright, dark, bright, dark? You saw that over a huge area there. Imagine now that light was particles, and that I would throw particles through here, and then some other particles through there, like tomatoes. Then what you would see, so I go one after another, either through one of the opening or through the other, because if it's a particle, it can only go through one opening. You cannot imagine if you throw a tomato that the tomato would split up and that half the tomato goes through one and half through the other. So one particle goes through one opening and then the next one may go to the other. What you would see now is just a pile of particles here and a pile of particles there. You see two light spots, that's it. End of story. That would be typical for particles, but instead, you see this enormous interference pattern, dark, bright, dark, bright. And so it is not so surprising that this was absolutely conclusive evidence that we're dealing here with, um, with waves. So now we can go one step further and we can ask ourselves the question, if we now go to a experiment like this whereby we have many small openings, not just two, which we call the double slit interference, but we have many, this many, capital N. And the separation between two openings is again that famous D, the same as it was before, except it could be much smaller if you want to make it very small. And now light comes from this direction, and now we collect it here on a screen, and this distance is L. The question is, what will you now see? And this math is more difficult. It is purely a matter of math. You now have to do a superposition of each one of these openings at any point in space and then calculate what the sum is of all these n waves and you will find locations where there is no light and you will find locations where there is maximum light. Now the beauty about this is, which we call gradings, The beauty about this is that if you have one hundred, if n is one hundred, then the width, the width of that bright maximum is fifty times smaller than if you had two. And I will demonstrate that to you. In other words, the maxima become extremely well defined. And if you use n equals a thousand, which will do today, then the width of the maxima shrinks by a factor of 500 in comparison with only two slots. And that is the great power of gradings. And I will make a sketch here of the light intensity. So this is light intensity. As you're going to see on the wall here, the wall will be here, but that's a detail. When we have red laser and we shine a red laser through a grating. If you had a red laser and you only had two slits, which are this far apart, I, I have to keep the distance the same to compare apples and apples, then you would have seen something like this, which is what you saw there, maximum darkness, maximum darkness, maximum darkness, maximum. But if now you do that with a grading which has, say, six lines instead of two, this maximum here becomes three times higher, uh, sorry, three times narrower, three times narrower, three times narrower, three times narrower, because six divided by two is three, and for reasons that I'm not going to explain, they're nine times higher. So they're higher and they are narrower. We give these locations a name. We call the one in the center zero order. We call this first order and we call this second order. And on this side, you also have first order and second order. And again, the number of maxima that you have is roughly 2D divided by lambda. I will get back to that. That's again the same idea, of course. If now you do this experiment with green light, you will see that the green light will have its zero maximum here because this is where the difference in path lengths is zero. 
that means the red light has its maximum, the green light, all the colors have their maximum, but you will see now that the maxima of the green light will fall here and will fall here, but there is a difference in wavelengths between red and green, and so there's a difference in the locations of those hyperboloids. But not at the zero, but here there will be differences, and then the third one would be somewhere here. And I will demonstrate that to you. So you're going to gain with a grading two things. You get more light and you get the lines very narrow. So you get the locations of brightness become extremely well defined. And I will work with your own gradings that you uh, have been given. Your own gradings have 13,400 lines per inch. That's what the manufacturer tells us. So your gradings have a separation between the grooves in the plastic which is um, 1.9 times 10 to the minus 6 meters, 1.9 microns. You can easily calculate that if you know that 13,400 lines per inch. And so you can even make a rough guess about how many nodal lines and how many antinodal lines there are going to be. That's going to be 2D divided by lambda, and that is about 3. So you could expect then first order, second order, and third order. Well, we will do this experiment with green light and with red light. And since the wavelength of red light is larger, we will just miss the three. We will get two orders in red, but in the green light, which has a smaller wavelength, you will see three. But this is the first thing that I want to do to have your grading, which is right here, we have your grading right here, it's the same one that you have, you will get a chance to use yours later. And we're going to show you what this interference pattern is going to be like on this screen, and you can compare it with that, which was two slits, those slits were a quarter millimeter apart, now you have a grading whereby the separation between the grooves is only about two microns, but not only does that give me a larger spacing between them, but look at the wonderful, uh, how well the maxima are defined. So I'll make it dark, make all dim in the class is probably enough. So you see how enormously well the maxima are defined. The diameter of the laser is about three millimeters, and so the three millimeters cover roughly 1,500 lines of your grading. And that's all that counts, of course, how many, what the, the number of capital N is. So you use about 1,500 lines, and so that gives you a shrinkage compared to two lines of a factor of 750. I always carry a grading with me, no matter where I go, and I will show you now, this is the same grading that you have, I will show you now with a green laser, which has a shorter wavelength, I will do this experiment it's the same, it's exactly the same grading, you have to take my word for it. And I will show you now that if I have a green laser, oh, oh. That notice that the separation between the bright green and the bright red is different, because the green has a different wavelength. The smaller wavelengths, the separation is smaller. And if Marcos is willing to walk all the way to the right, he can show you the third order in green, but the third order in red does not exist. And so this now is an amazing tool to analyze the spectra of the various gases when you heat them. They uh, produce characteristic set of colors, a characteristic set of um, frequencies, and these can now be studied and they can be viewed with your, um, uh, with your grading. Uh, if you look at helium, you will see that it is not like the sun, that you see a continuum of all the colors, like the rainbow, but that you see very distinct lines in the helium. And the reason why we call them lines is really a misnomer 
because we do these experiments with sources, light sources, which themselves are lines. And that's what I'm going to show you. And I want you to use your own gradings now. So if you get your own gradings, then I'm going to make you look through those gradings, look at a light source here, which itself is going to be a line. And if you hold your grading the right way, you have to try that a little bit, you will see this spectrum. First, you see zero order, where all the colors overlap. That's in the middle. You will see first order, second order, third order, maybe, depends on the color. And I'm going to make it completely dark. And then you see this amazing thing, how nature, in this case, produces uh, unique frequencies, uh, discrete frequencies, and no longer a continuum. And the, and the, the grading is an ideal tool to, uh, to see them. And try to look on both sides of the zero order so that you can see the, um, the first order. Yeah, I see the first order. Wow, the, notice that at the zero order in the center, all the colors overlap. There's a maximum. That's zero order. But there, since, since the, the difference in path length is zero, of course, all the colors overlap there. But then when you go to first order, you see clearly that the blue is closer to the zero order than the yellow, and the red is the farthest away, and then you see a second order, and I can even see many colors in third order, and I see the same on the left side. I can show you now neon, which is also very interesting. Oh yeah, I see clearly first order, second order, and most colors, even the most colors I see in, in third order. So you should now be convinced that light comes in the form of waves, as suggested by Huygens, and not in the form of particles, as suggested by Newton. And that was the goal of my talk today. However, as I mentioned earlier, I could give another talk in which I could convince you that light does not consist of waves, but that light actually consists of particles. Uh, 20th century physics has shown that light comes in the form of individual photons, and these photons can be localized in space, and we can detect them and we can count them in a similar way that you can detect and count individual tomatoes, which is a very different picture from a spherical wave moving out in all directions. We're now talking about small bullets, well localized, and you can detect them like tomatoes. So instead of throwing light photons at you, I could make an attempt to throw tomatoes at you. These are very nice. I grow them in my own backyard, and they are very soft. So if you catch them, don't squeeze too hard. You want one? It will remind you for the rest of your life what a photon is not. Ooh, good for you. I can throw some other photons to you. Here goes a photon. There goes a photon. And another photon. And for Peter, another photon. And for you there, another photon. Two photons. Now how can light be waves and particles at the same time? In the case of our two-slit experiment, which was Jan did, light waves go through both slits. That's easy. You can just see that. There is no problem at all. In this picture, if light is a wave, it goes simultaneously through both. But if light is really a bullet, a photon, a particle, then it either goes through one opening or it goes through the other opening. So how can it be now that we see this interference pattern if we argue, or if we can argue, that they are also particles and bullets? And here lies now the great 
mystery in physics which caused me and others sleepless nights. And the secret to this is the following. As long as you do not measure through which opening the photon went, you will see a beautiful interference pattern. The moment that you make an effort, which you can do, and you measure through which one of these openings the photon went, you have destroyed the interference pattern, you don't see the interference pattern anymore, the light says, you want me to be a particle? You pay a price for that. And this is the price that you pay, it will only show you one pile of photons here and one pile of photons there. But light says, if you don't ask to which opening I went, then that's fine, then you behave, and then I will show you the interference pattern. And so this is a bizarreness, of course, that no one really can completely understand, and this is, of course, where quantum mechanics comes in. That is when you take 804 and 805 at MIT, and this is why I said earlier in my lecture, once you have taken 804 and 805, you have no clue anymore what light is all about. So yes, it can behave like a particle, but it can also behave like a wave, and that depends on what experiment you do and how you do the experiment. It is one or the other. And I have highlighted today only the wave character. Now I'm looking forward to seeing some of you in my classes. There is a chance that you will come to MIT and there is also a chance that you will have me, maybe a few years from now. And then we can talk about this some more. And I want you to appreciate the fact that this is not easy stuff. Not for you, but not for me either, believe me. Thank you, it was nice having you here.